fabulous. Um, I'm going to be talking about um, biologically addressing bone marrow lesions in the knee. So really generically, um, there's this term bone marrow edema. Uh, just basically is we see this a lot in any type of all of our knee pathologies. And really it's an like older term. So now we're using this term bone marrow lesions, which is just a... Uh, just uh, we're changing it from the edema because uh, of the histological analysis of the tissue now. There's really no edematous type tissue in there. And I'll go through some of the histology that we see. But these are pretty difficult type of um, uh, lesions to treat. Uh, a lot of people that I see in my clinic are basically, they've been told that they need a total knee replacement. And so they might have some mild OA and like a lot of bone marrow lesions. And so I think we have some good options to address this. So, uh, so these bone marrow lesions, really they're focal changes um, underneath the subchondral bone. Uh, most of the time, the biggest symptom that uh, my patients come in is with pain, and they literally will pinpoint exactly um, on their knee where that pain is. Um, usually it's pain with weight bearing, um, not really so much the mechanical type symptoms that we see with any cartilage type um, issues or meniscal type issues. Um, Usually I get an MRI, uh, after, you know, they usually come with x-rays, I usually get an MRI, some people recommend doing a CT scan, but an MRI really looking at the fluid sensitive sequences, um, whether that's T2, PD fat sat, uh, I'm sorry, PD uh, with fat suppression or stir, these are really going to highlight these bone marrow lesions. So the etiology, there, I mean, a lot of what we see obviously is kind of the bone contusions, whether it's an ACL tear or whether it's a, a patella dislocation. Those are the kind of cute things that we see these bone marrow lesions, but we do see them in mild to moderate osteoarthritis. I see a lot of my patients with stress and insufficient fractures. It might be um, a little bit older women, maybe between 60 and 70 years old. Um, and then usually my rheumatologic partners usually see the ones that have the ABN or the SOM. Just really looking at the histology, what we see here is that it can be, usually most of the time, it's just cysts that are um, in there, but it's an uh, increase in blood vessels. Um, there's also some fat necrosis going on in there, maybe some non-healing chronic stress fractures as well. And the goal here is really, um, uh, and I'll kind of go through the treatment options, is we're really looking now more, instead of stabilizing these types of lesions, we're really looking at healing them. So mainstay for these, obviously, is conservative management. You kind of want to try everything as long as possible. Uh, this patient here uh, had a uh, bone marrow lesion extensive in the lateral femoral condyle. Four months later, it comes back, MRI, he really doesn't have any pain. MRI really shows that the bone marrow uh, edema has kind of, or lesion has kind of gone away. So they do, most of them do resolve on their own. Um, definitely can try a motor brace, you know, some injections. Um, there has been talk about using bisphosphonates, but they're really off-label right now for the bone marrow lesions. So surgical indications, um, I'll let you know mine, I kind of starred them. So obviously you don't want somebody coming in with extensive osteoarthritis, maybe some mild to moderate, moderate osteoarthritis with these bone marrow lesions. Um, but really, uh, you know, I'm listening to the patient and they're telling me the symptoms are really matching exactly where um, that subchondral edema is. And then I'm really looking probably about three to six months afterwards. I'm just trying at all the conservative management I can. If it doesn't resolve, then we talk about surgery. So surgical treatment options, really three right now. So the first one is just, just a core decompression, and that's just going in there with a drill. We're really trying to reduce the intraosseous pressure in there. Um, more of what has been going on is a more of a subchondroplasty, which people are using, which you do a core decompression, and then you're filling in that defect with calcium phosphate. What's happened lately is there's been a lot of mixed results with that, and there's been more um, conversions to total knee arthroplasty. So now we're looking at, hey, the stabilization of these lesions isn't really working. Let's look at healing. And so this is what we're going to talk about is the intraosseous bioplasty, which is same thing, doing that core uh, decompression, but now using a biological mixture to fill in that area. So with the intraosseous bioplasty, again, you're directly injecting um, uh, from a bone marrow harvest uh, using an angel system, and that's giving you a concentrated PRP, and then you're mixing that with a DVM, which is your uh, scaffold. And really, the goal is to decompress the lesions that, um, and really change the environment of that lesion. We're 
looking at remodeling and healing that area. So that's the goal of this procedure. So bone marrow harvest, you can take it from three main areas. I mean, if you're really at the knee, I usually prep out the entire extremity. Um, you can go from the proximal tibia, the calcaneus, or the anterior iliac crest. I usually use the proximal tibia, it's just there, it's convenient, I can do that first, and then I'm able to get my 60 millimeters of harvest. I really don't have much trouble doing it. Um, look in the literature as far as there's any differences in the progenitor cells that we're getting. Um, we know that you're getting a similar amount of cells in each of those um, locations, but the differential potential of uh, the cells from the anterior iliac crest has been shown to be better. So usually when I'm in the OR, I have my MRI up, and then I'm getting AP lateral on the knee. Um, just taking my uh, drill and finding that location, and then kind of drilling into that to the depth of location based off of my MRI, and then removing that, and then putting the cannula down, and then delivering my mixture of DBM and that concentrated PRP. Uh, you can do, just do the DBM and the concentrated PRP. I use a contrast as well, so that helps me while I'm in the OR using fluoroscopy. Um, I can um, just see that kind of area dark enough, and I have an image of that on my patients. So here are the uh, cannula options. So the first one is the closed tip. You basically have these two fenestrations on either side, and I like uh, this option basically for the larger lesions because like, I can rotate it around about 360, deliver the, the mixture, and then rotate it back around so I can kind of almost get a 360 um, kind of coverage of that lesion. The open tip, usually I just use for my smaller lesions where I can go directly at it and just deliver that, lesion, uh, that mixture right into that area. So what's now coming out that I just found that I think is going to be great is now we're, uh, they're coming out with a flip cutter, which I think is going to be awesome. So basically you're going to be able to take a guide down, um, decompress, and then put the cannula down and be able to flip cut and then bring back and then kind of make a little open cavity to allow um, that mixture to go in. I think it's going to help. What happens is when you have so much interest in, interest in pressure, uh, you, you have to use the one millimeter syringes to kind of keep putting in the mixture, and I think this will open up that area where we'll be able to get it in that cavity. So uh, here's my uh, case presentation, 57-year-old female dermatologist, chronic uh, left knee pain. Uh, she had a microfracture on her lateral tibial plateau two years prior to seeing me, still having a lot of pain with weight bearing and really just, just pushing on that lateral tibial plateau. She didn't really have the mechanical symptoms or anything like that. So that was her MRI showing that um, pretty large bone marrow lesion. Um, and then arthroscopically, I went in and saw that microfracture area that was uh, incompletely filled. Uh, I used the, uh, the closed tip, uh, put my cannula in there, and then you can see the two holes are kind of facing up towards the joint. Um, and then I went up to inject that, and then kind of rotate around and inject. And then my final shot, you can kind of see that contrast there kind of lighten up in the area exactly where that lesion was. And so six months later, she's doing great, really no pain, not you know, doing all her fun activities. So I think just some helpful tips. Obviously, the patient selection is just really critical for this. Um, getting the MRI, listening to the exam, you know, doing the conservative management. Uh, MRI again is key, looking at those fluid sequences. And um, I usually prep the entire leg out in the OR. Um, uh, if I need to go up to the iliac crest, I will, but really I get, I get plenty out of the proximal tibia as far as my harvest. Um, using that one millimeter syringe is also helpful because you can kind of keep putting the mixture in and then you don't get that back pressure. But I think this new flip cutter is really going to help that. And then using a high density contrast I think is really helpful as well. So my post-op protocol, I, I use, um, I'm having you not only bearing at least for three to four weeks. Again, the goal is really to heal this lesion. I don't have a brace or anything. They start range of motion immediately. Um, some can't tolerate, obviously, that. You could probably do toe touch weight bearing and this would probably be pretty fun. So looking not a whole lot of literature out, some of the newer literature right now, um, uh, Akaban in uh, the Yellow Journal has really good overview of kind of all the treatment options. Going on again, there's a push going away from the kind of subchondroplasty and the calcium phosphate and moving over to um, this type of biologic uh, injection. I think the big thing that we're going to see coming out is we know that these bone marrow lesions are really big pain generators, so there's going to be a lot of targeting that. And then Hurtigal um, also had a 
uh, study that I like looked at, most of the people have been told that they need a total knee replacement, and so they looked at treatments that postpone this, and so they did an intra-articular injection of FEMAP versus doing it into this subchondrally, and after 15 year follow-up, they basically found that the time to conversion to a total knee arthroplasty was longer in the actual subchondral VMEC um, injection. So overview, I think this is a great option for those patients that have insufficiency fractures, uh, mild to moderate maybe OA, early stages of ABN, um, great combination decompression, use of biologic, low risk to the patient because it's coming from them, but really encouraging physiolo physiologic bone remodeling. So thank you very much.